Hello, Hello, welcome back. <laughs> so happy Thank to you. see you. Honestly, I'm jealous of you. <clears throat> you know it with what you say. <laughs> yes, today morning I got from, uh, from Kenya and yeah, I'm no. having a very bad cough and everything whatever it is <laughs> because it's migration season, it's dusty all over. Yeah. I ate a lot of dust <laughs> and I can feel that now. <laughs> At least I feel a little okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, let's leave us. We have someone special yeah. from Canada. Yes. And he started photography from the age of five. I think that's what I read in the introduction. Like, somebody is starting photography from the age of five from a beautiful country like this. I'm dying to see his images. So what else you want to add here, me? And uh, he's from your place where you lived yes. for uh, like last three uh, years. years in yes. Vancouver. And almost all of his photos are taken from Canada. Wonderful. Looking forward to see the images and enjoy the photographs. So it's welcome, Lyran. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to, to present. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you for, for coming. Exciting time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, we have seen your uh, social media profiles, and but we would like to know from you, how did you got into photography? A little bit of about you and then your images and the story behind your journey, yeah. your fascination and your ideas. Yeah, so uh, like you mentioned, I, I took my first photos when I was around five years old, um, which is a little crazy to think about, but I've grown up my whole life in the beautiful city of Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. And we have incredible access here to the outdoors. We have lots of green spaces and those parks are home to a lot of birds. Um, so going for walks in the neighborhood and visiting those kind of urban parks um, with my family as a kid, uh, I just had, there was something that sparked in me. I just fell in love with nature and I fell in love with photography. My, my parents had like a little point and shoot camera. So I would start just by, you know, like begging them to borrow that point and shoot camera so I could take pictures of the ducks and other birds at the local parks. Um, and that passion has just grown and grown. Um, I now uh, am, for the first time in my life, now pursuing photography full-time. I just finished being a student. I just graduated with a biology degree from the University of British Columbia. And I'm now oh. pursuing photography full-time. So spending a lot of time outdoors, taking photos, running tours and workshops and, and selling photography and that sort of thing. Um, and it's very exciting to, to be doing this. That's amazing. I mean, this is one career which a lot of people dream of. So welcome to the world. <laughs> That's amazing. And Thank I'm you. so happy to meet someone from this part of the world. That, you know, life is quite busy in the last three years. So someone from here is always like a fresh air. <laughs> Thank you. And how about we jumping into the presentation and take us through your journey, through the behind the stories and the tips and techniques? Sounds great. All right. So yeah, um, Perfect. here with the first one. All right, well, thanks again, everyone, so much for, for joining. Um, like I said, I, uh, I'm based here in Canada. So the photos we're gonna be looking at today are all, most of them, the vast majority of them are taken here in Canada. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about who I am. Uh, this is a photo of me captured by my friend Ian. Um, this is in Kluwani National Park in the southern Yukon Territory, right on the border with uh, British Columbia. And wow. I think this photo kind of that my friend Ian snapped of me, it really captures where I love to be. Um, I love to be outdoors. There's, there's no place in the world that, uh, that brings me more joy <laughs> and excitement than the outdoors. Um, I love hiking. I love to be up in the mountains a lot. I also love being down by the sea. Um, and I think that fits really, really well for someone who is, you know, grown up in this part of the world in Western Canada, where we have beautiful marine life, as we'll be looking at today, and beautiful mountains, um, some incredible ecosystems that while they seem very different, are actually quite connected. And that's one of the things we'll be looking at. Um, that's amazing. While I have photographed mostly in Canada, um, I have done a little bit of photography in other places. And, and I'll show you, I wanted to show just a couple, maybe like to grab your attention, show you some color. Um, and share a couple images I captured, not in Canada. Um, these were captured in Ecuador, in Yasuni National Park, um, in, the, in the Amazon. Um, and there are places in the Amazon called Claylix, where 
birds yeah. like parakeets and parrots come to eat that nutrient rich mud. Um, and that helps kind of counteract the effects of uh, very acidic and toxic fruits that they eat. And after three days of, of waiting in a hide for these parakeets to descend to the forest floor, it finally happened. And one of the things that, um, you know, there's pros and cons to sitting and waiting for a photo to happen and for a moment to happen. But one, one of the things that I always like to think about while I'm waiting for something to happen is, I have all this time, so what am I actually going to do when what I'm waiting for happens? You have all this time to prepare and plan in your head what your photo is going to look like. Um, and when the moment finally happened, I was ready. I was using kind of a slower shutter speed to capture a little bit of uh, motion blur in the wings, as you can see as the parakeets descended to the forest floor. And I also captured this photo here, the moments they took off. Um, this is at about, I think, like uh, about a thirteenth of a second or so, um, just a blur of that uh, of that motion from those parakeets taking off. I call this image colorful chaos. Um, those beautiful cobalt winged parakeets taking off in the Ecuadorian Amazon. So when a lot of people think of beautiful places in the world, they think of places like this and the Ecuadorian Amazon is absolutely spectacular. But like I've talked about, I think my part of the world, Western Canada is spectacular as well. So I wanna take you back home um, to the place where I live, um, the uh, province of British Columbia. Um, like I said, some incredible mountains in this area and some beautiful glaciers. Uh, this here is the Salmon Glacier. It's, uh, I believe, the fourth largest glacier in North America. It's one of the largest. It's a remnant of the last ice age. And this photo here is actually like a, a, a big panorama that I shot with a telephoto lens. So it's very high resolution. Um, I like shooting landscapes with telephoto lenses because it brings those more distant mountains forward and creates a little bit of a like telephoto compression where things that are further away look bigger. Um, than they do when you capture them with a wide angle lens. So this photo is like, I can't remember the exact number, maybe like 10 to 20 panels stitched together into a panorama. Um, and I think it just captures that beauty of the mountains in this part of the world. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we've got some incredible wildlife that lives in the mountains around here too. Um, one of my favorite animals are the mountain goats. Um, actually a pretty difficult species to find. Um, they, they, I think, uh, you know, a very large portion of the world's mountain goats live here in British Columbia, um, mm -hmm. but they're very specific in habitat. But I have so much respect for these animals because, you know, they can climb vertical slopes with ease. They're walking down like pure ice and uh, traversing deep cliffs and valleys. Um, and it's absolutely remarkable that they can do this. And they, they live in the mountains. They have to tolerate temperatures that are reaching like minus 30 degrees in the winter. And when I took this photo, there was a heat wave. So it was almost 30 degrees above zero. Um, so these are really, really, um, you know, intense animals, um, even though they kind of look just, just like a goat, um, they are, they're quite remarkable and they are one of my favorites. And they're wonderful. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah so here's another animal, um, which, uh, is found across all of Canada. This is the Canada lynx. Um, we have, you know, when people think of wild cats, they tend to think of more of the African and Asian continents, also South America. Um, and, but we do have wild cats here in, in Canada as well. Um, we have bobcats, we have cougars, and we have Canada lynx. And for all the years and all the time I've spent out in the field, I've yet to actually see a cougar or a bobcat, although I've seen plenty of tracks and droppings. But I have seen a couple Canada lynx, and I photographed this one uh, right in the southern Yukon Territory on the border of British Columbia. Um, this was the first lynx that I ever saw, um, and they are remarkable animals. They, they're they kind of one of the most, like, sometimes these animals can be skittish, but this one, like, it pretty much completely ignored my presence. Oh. Um, this photo where it was looking at the camera was like a split second. It was like a three-minute encounter, maybe, and this was a split second when it glanced towards me, and it's the only photo I have of the lynx actually looking towards the camera. It was just completely uh, in its environment, um, hunting probably snowshoe hares. It's the main thing that these animals eat are the, are the snowshoe hares. Oh, amazing. But uh, as if you've been following my work or maybe this is your first time seeing my work, um, one thing you should know is that I love to photograph birds. Um, most of my time is spent photographing birds and there's a few reasons for that. One, um, birds are definitely the most accessible thing to photograph. Um, especially living in the city here, you know, you can go to a park and you can see ducks and you can see hummingbirds. So yep. growing up, birds would be very easy for me to photograph. 
But more than that, I just am fascinated by birds. I love bird behavior. I love bird plumage. Everything they do, that they do is so remarkable and so unique. And I think one bird that really captures that uniqueness is this species here. This is the white-tailed ptarmigan. It's basically a mountain chicken. And white-tailed ptarmigans uh, live so high up in the mountains, they only live where trees can't grow. So they live up in that alpine tundra. And in the wintertime, they turn their feathers to be pure white. And then in the summertime, they molt and change their feathers to be kind of a more brown plumage like you see here in order to blend yeah. in with their surroundings. And their surroundings are beautiful. So I really wanted to capture a photo that showcased those surroundings. Um, and because this is a bird that relies mostly on camouflage for protection, if you're patient and you sit and wait, they're often very cooperative, but they're very hard to find. So, you know, dozens of hikes later, I found a group of ptarmigan in Jasper National Park that were, uh, were very cooperative. I just sat down among them and they were feeding and I put on my wide angle lens and I captured this photo here of this ptarmigan overlooking the beautiful mountain scenery in Jasper National Park. And this photo recently was awarded uh, the professional winner in the Audubon Photography Awards, which was very exciting. I was kind of thrilled that such an obscure kind of unique bird uh, got the time to shine. That made me really happy. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We have other beautiful bird life as well. Wow. This here is the provincial bird of British Columbia, the Stellar's Jay. Um, beautiful. And for so long, I wanted to get a photo of one that showcased the bird and the blue sky. Um, and after several years of hiking in the mountains, looking for these birds, like dozens upon dozens of hikes, I finally managed to get this shot um, that I was very, very happy with of that beautiful Stellar's Jay in flight. Wonderful. But now that we've looked at some of the, you know, general, you know, highlights and beauty of this part of the world where I live, I want to focus in on a few specific um, kind of genres of photography and spectacles that you can witness here. And one of my favorite things to witness is the bird migration on the Pacific Flyway. So the Pacific Flyway is this migratory route that birds take um, basically migrating up the Pacific coast of North and South America in the spring, heading up towards, you know, the Arctic the Canadian North, Alaska, and then in the fall, they're migrating south down the Canadian coast, the American coast, the South American coast along their migration. And I'm super fortunate that based in Vancouver, you know, we have some of the most important stopover sites on the Pacific Flyway here um, in the form of the Fraser River Delta, a huge kind of mud flat and estuary area where birds stop to refuel on their migration. And also a lot of birds have as in final destination or a wintering destination along the Pacific Flyway migration. And we get big flocks of birds. Um, these here are Dunlin, which nest up in the Arctic, but migrate down the Pacific Flyway and winter in the area here. Um, mm -hmm. Dunlin are a little sandpiper and they can form flocks that are in the tens of thousands. And they form these beautiful murmurations where the Dunlins are just swirling around, kind of like you may have seen with starlings, um, especially yeah. in Europe, um, but all over the world. Um, and I wanted to capture that motion. So I used a slow shutter speed at sunset to get those beautiful warm colors and to capture the motion in the wings. And this was the uh, resulting image. Beautiful. So this is what a Dunlin looks like up close um, when it's in their breeding plumage. So they develop in the spring, these black bellies and these kind of orange backs, which is very beautiful. And they use that long beak to kind of probe into the mud. Um, they're feeding on all sorts of things. Here, one has caught some sort of, uh, you know, invertebrate, some worm that it pulled out of the mud flats. But they actually spend a lot of time feeding on microscopic um, life. Uh, there's there's a layer of life that sits on the mud flats called biofilm, which we're just learning more about still. Um, just microscopic life, and they they use their beak to kind of filter that out of the mud. So they're eating all sorts of things. Uh, but this one here caught a kind of fairly a fairly large juicy worm in the mud. And I love photographing the flocks in flight. Um, birds in flight, I mean, I think flight is one of the things that has always fascinated me the most about birds. So I spend huge amounts of time trying to photograph birds in flight. Um, and I just love photographing the flocks like this one here and this one here. This is a flock of Western sandpipers flying straight at me. And wow. one of the things about these birds, um, these sandpipers that are migrating through uh, the Fraser River Delta, um, is that they, a lot of them probably have never seen people before because especially at this time of year, starting now, a lot of the birds we're seeing, almost all of the birds we're seeing kind of like in August, September, October are young birds on their first migration from the Arctic. So they don't really have much fear. However, 
um, they're they're only f not fearful if you're staying still and in your one place. So these birds will come to you, but they don't very much like you going to them. So it's a lot about watching their behaviors, figuring out where the birds are going and getting into position so that the birds come to you and you can get great shots of them. And that's how I've managed to get close ups like this one here. Wow. a western sandpiper i mean they will come within feet of you if you've just kind of been lying down in the mud or sitting on the mud flats waiting they will come and it makes for um for some cool portraits like this but i always like to try bird to capture birds in their environment um and this is an example of a time where i was photographing a bird a shorebird this is a red-necked fowler rope another bird that nests up in the arctic and it was coming so close that i put on my wide angle lens and I captured this photo here of the, the redneck phalarope with a, the wide angle lens. Um, kind of, I loved the reflection. I loved the ripples in the water. Um, and it made for a, a really beautiful scene. And you can kind of get a sense here of what that habitat looks like out on the mudflats. Yeah. Wonderful. So here's another look at what the mudflats look like. And this photo captures the other thing the birds are here to do. So the birds are here to eat, but they're also here to rest. Um, it is absolutely remarkable to me that some of these birds will fly thousands of kilometers in one go. They will be flying for days at a time without resting, without eating. Um, they are sleeping part, you know, they're partially sleeping while they're flying. They know where they need to go and they're flying over open waters where if they are exhausted, they have nowhere to land. Um, but there are some, you know, some species will do that in one go. A very famous one is the bar-tailed godwit, which can migrate from the Arctic all the way to like, Australia, New Zealand in one flight. Um, but there's other birds that will do long flights with stopovers. And a few years ago in the spring, I encountered this flock of red knots, a beautiful threatened species um, resting on the mudflats. And here's a photo of them all lined up. They were doing the, the fun thing where the waves are crashing and they're kind of running towards you as the waves crash and they run back towards the water as the waves fall. Um, and the great thing about photographing shorebirds here in spring is that they are in these beautiful breeding colors um, that you usually just see up in the Arctic. Um, so it's really a nice time to photograph them because it just adds so much color to the images. Great. So we also get big flocks of birds that aren't uh, shorebirds. We have big flocks of snow geese migrating through here. Um, we have hundreds of thousands that pass through on their journey from Siberia to you know, North America. Um, every year. And here's another example of using a slow shutter speed to capture the chaos the moment a eagle came and flushed all of these uh, snow geese off of the ground. Um, it's a really spectacular thing to witness our flocks of snow geese here in migration season and in the winter. And another flocking bird that I love to photograph are these ones. This is a sea duck called the surf scoter. And they really love to, uh, to gather here to eat mussels. So they dive underwater and they, they eat mussels and, uh, and can crack them and swallow them whole with their beak if they so choose. Um, and I always like to get a low perspective when I'm photographing ducks, but here I was purposefully like a little bit higher because I wanted to see that depth of the flock a little bit. If I got right down to the bottom, I would just see that front row. So I wanted to kind of capture that chaos of, uh, of this big flock of scoters. They're all just kind of diving and creating lots of splashes. And this is one of my favorite spectacles because you can see it like from downtown Vancouver, like where all the tall office buildings and high rises are, people who have windows overlooking the water can look out their window and see thousands of surf scoters. So it's a pretty special thing that we have here. But we've looked at some of the larger, uh, you know, water related birds. There's also some small land birds um, that migrate through here. We get great warbler migration in the springtime. This here is a yellow rumped warbler. It's a very fall colored image, but it was actually taken in the spring. Um, in one of my local parks here, there's some trees, which I have to assume aren't native, um, that, uh, that bloom orange and yellow in the springtime. And it actually makes for really great shots of the warblers. Um, the warblers often go and there's often like little uh, worms and, and bugs underneath the leaves. So they go and they kind of pick those bugs from off the leaves. And we also have some beautiful swallow species. This here is a purple marten with a, a dragonfly or two in its beak. Um, wow. Another species that uh, was is, is very threatened um, and was very threatened, but now thanks to um, the installation of nest boxes, um, we're starting to see their numbers return. So this is a bird, all, all, these, all these swallows um, nest in cavities. Um, and without tree cavities, holes in trees, they don't have anywhere to nest. And a lot of the times those tree cavities are, form in dead trees. So especially around more urban areas, those dead trees tend to get removed, which doesn't leave them with a place to nest. And also 
they like to be around wetlands where there's bugs because that's their food source and there's less wetlands there's less bugs around so it's you know a hard time for these birds these aerial insectivores have experienced huge declines in the last few decades um, but fortunately thanks to the nest boxes around the city there are populations of these birds that can survive in the area and they're just absolutely beautiful they are yeah, and it's, it's spectacular. To capture them, it's they're so fast. They are fast. You know, when it comes to photographing birds in flight, I say like if you haven't taken a thousand photos yet of the bird you're trying to photograph, <laughs> you probably haven't gotten the best shot. Um, <laughs> it's just a numbers game. You got like I, I always, whenever I'm trying to photograph birds in flight, I'm photographing literally thousands of photos, and then I'm picking out like the one or two that <laughs> are you know perfect and sharp and and have something interesting going on. Yeah. <laughs> So before we move on to kind of the next wow. subject, here is one more um, bird that is a migrant here. This one blows me away. This is the Rufus hummingbird. Um, it is a, a species that lives in Mexico in the winter time, and they migrate up to uh, North America, all the way as far north as kind of northern Canada and Alaska in the spring. Um, but when they arrive in the springtime in like April, um, they will really gravitate towards blooming flowers because those flowers provide a really important source of energy for them. And especially in the evening hours, um, they will, you can sometimes see like a dozen hummingbirds feeding from just a few bushes of flowers, refueling before the nighttime. And there's near my university where I studied, it was actually a friend of mine, uh, Liam, who discovered some flowers um, that these hummingbirds were really, really gravitating towards every evening right on campus. Mm. Um, so I went with him to photograph them, and it's these beautiful red flowering currants. It's a native species here. They were planted at the university, but it's a native species. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, I captured this shot just looking through all these flowers in the foreground and getting this beautiful pink scene. Wow. And then the next year, this past spring, I captured this shot here. And one thing that is wow. very unique about photographing in on the university compared to just out in a park is that there's a lot of lights. So yeah. this area where these hummingbirds are, there's street lamps above lighting it up at nighttime. So as it's getting really, really dark, the scene is becoming pretty much exclusively lit by street lamps. Mm -hmm. So these street lights were shining on these flowers and on this hummingbird kind of backlighting it as it was like dusk. It was really, really getting dark. So I took advantage of that and captured this photo here, um, just lit by street lamps. Um, with that, it was almost nighttime. It was like dusk, so really getting that kind of dark background. Um, and I was really, uh, really happy with how it looked. It's amazing. They're they're amazing birds. And I want to share my favorite bird that migrates on the Pacific Flyway. Um, this is one that I don't see around my home city of Vancouver usually, but you do see them further offshore and nesting up in kind of further north on the Pacific Flyway. This is the Arctic Tern. Yeah. The Arctic Tern is a bird that doesn't weigh very much, maybe the, the weight of a phone, um, and they have the longest migration of any animal in the world. So these birds are migrating from the Antarctic in their, as their non-breeding grounds to the Arctic for their breeding grounds. They go from pole to pole. Um, it's a huge migration that they go. I believe single birds have been tracked going like around 95,000 kilometers in a year. And in this bird's 30-year lifespan, that totals to several million kilometers of migration the equivalent distance of flying like to the moon and back a few times right. or doing like 60 plus laps around the earth so a remarkable bird they return to the same spots to nest and i've in northern british columbia which is kind of kind of the southern end of where these birds breed i've gone on hikes to find these birds and you know year after year finding them in the same spots and it's just amazing to me to think that these terns, since I last saw them, first of all, they're probably the same birds that I saw the year before because they returned to the same nest spots. But since I last saw them, you know, they've just flown to Antarctica and back, no problem. <laughs> um, and uh, so this particular shot was taken on a really stormy day. Um, and this tern was flying over and just was beautifully kind of silhouetted against this really dramatic sky. But they are beautiful birds, so much character um, and personality, and they are beautiful to photograph. They're my favorite bird in the world. That's great. <laughs> so I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different genre of photography, mm -hmm. um, which actually relates to wildlife photography a surprising amount. Okay. Um, and that is astrophotography. Oh, great. I wanted to throw this in because it's something a little bit different, um, but I think it's something that kind of I've really become interested in lately and okay. lately as in kind of the last 10 years. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I actually think kind of 
honing my skills in astrophotography has really helped my wildlife photography. Nice. But it didn't start out as, I didn't start out knowing what I was doing. This is the first photo I ever captured of the night sky. Um, not great. Um, I just kind of pointed my, my camera to the skies and took a picture with like what I thought was a good exposure setting. And this was the result, not what I'm proud of, but you know, you have to start somewhere. Yep. And something that happened to me it, that kind of changed my life was in grade nine um, in high school. Um, I had a science teacher named Mr. Prosset. Here's a photo of Mr. Prosset. This was at his retirement party, which was the year after. So I just managed to get Mr. Prosset. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Prosset did a unit on astronomy, on space. And at this point, I'd already been photographing for a while. Um, I'd been photographing, you know, since I was like five or six years old. But I hadn't really spent time photographing the night sky. And Mr. Prosick was just so inspiring. His, his way of teaching, it was just, it was infectious, the excitement that he had and, um, and engaging and inspiring. And, I, and through this astronomy unit, I just became blown away with the wonders of space. So thanks to that spark of inspiration from Mr. Prosick, I all of a sudden was like, okay, I need to spend more time photographing the night sky. And since then I've gone on uh, lots of uh, dedicated adventures to photograph the night sky. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is to use kind of not your classic like wide angle 14 millimeter or 20 millimeter image, but, you know, shoot at longer focal lengths, like 100 millimeters, like I used for this image here and capture more detail. Mm -hmm. Now, my approach to astrophotography is a little bit different from wildlife photography. When I'm shooting wildlife, I'm very much photographing in a photojournalistic way. I'm trying to capture photos that represent what I'm seeing with my eyes and what I'm experiencing with my eyes. Yep. But the amazing thing about the night sky is that there is so much more in the night sky that is completely real. It's right in front of us. We just can't see it. It's hidden. It's too dark and too dim for us to see. Our eyes aren't equipped with the correct technology to see the night sky. And that's where the power of long exposures and techniques like exposure stacking and star tracking come in. So I'm using these kind of more advanced techniques to capture as much detail as possible. And the result is an image that is not at all what you can see with your eyes, but it's much more, it is completely scientifically accurate in that it is all real things that is just too dim for our eyes to see. Um, and, you know, we've got some remarkable things in recent years. This is Comet Neowise. I was photographing Comet Neowise in the summer of 2020, and all of a sudden the northern lights showed up. And here in, in Vancouver in southern Canada, we do not get northern lights very often. It really takes uh, some, you know, it, it can happen a few times a year, but it takes very specific conditions with solar energy kind of coming from the sun and hitting us uh, here at Earth. But it does occasionally happen. And here's a photo from this past fall when the northern lights were bright enough that I could photograph them right from the core of the city. Um, wow. If you're a Vancouverite, you'll obviously recognize this as Prospect Point yes. and Stanley Park and the Lionsgate Bridge on the right there looking over the North Shore Mountains. Um, this was in October this past fall, and it was it was wow. incredible. It was absolutely amazing to see green lights glowing on the horizon from my home city. Amazing. But the most incredible experience I've ever had um, photographing the night sky has to be this night. This is a photo a friend of mine, Ian Harlan, captured of me um, just photographing the stars. I didn't even know he was like, like he told me, like, can you just hold still for a split second so I can get the shot? So I like held still, but I didn't know he was like, like taking this shot, like this wasn't staged, this was the scene. Um, Beautiful. And uh, the amazing thing about this night, um, this was up in the Yukon territory. So very cold, minus 20 degrees, um, everything is covered in snow. The amazing thing about this night is that it was so dark, no light pollution whatsoever, and the ground was covered in snow. So it felt like I was in a void. Like I couldn't tell where the stars ended, like where the sky ended and where the ground began. That's how dark and dreamy it was. And because there were all these mountains, it wasn't like there was just like a flat horizon around us. It was like this photo here captures, I thought Ian did an amazing job with this photo, uh, just this behind the scenes shot of me photographing because it really captures that feeling of being in the void. Like it's the most beautiful feeling ever, but it was just so remarkable. Yeah. Um, and if you notice, there's a little bit of a green glow. I don't know if it'll come across yeah. on a cast, yeah. there's a little bit of a green glow. And that green on me yeah. is coming from my screen because my screen was photographing the Northern Lights. Ooh, wow. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to go up to the Yukon in the winter 
was to photograph the Northern Lights, and we were not disappointed. We we had a beautiful show um, of you know just colorful lights dancing in the night sky. It's like unlike anything I'd ever experienced. You know, when we see Northern Lights down here in Vancouver, you've got like a little bit of a glow on the horizon, but when you see Northern Lights up there, the sky is full of light and it's moving and it's remarkable. But Amazing. let's talk a little bit about how this connects to wildlife. Well. There's one issue that relates to astrophotography, which is light pollution. Um, yeah. So light pollution is kind of the effect of city lights um, making it really hard to see the night sky. So here's an example of two photos taken with pretty much identical exposure settings. On the left is a photo taken right outside where I live here in Vancouver, like a, a, what a 30 second, 20, 30 second exposure looks like right here in Vancouver. And on the right is what a 20 or 30 second exposure looks like in uh, in a dark site. This is in the Rocky Mountains. I believe this was in uh, uh, near Yoho National Park. Um, okay. And you can see the difference. And, you know, for one, it would be really nice if everyone could kind of experience the night sky because people, I, I feel like until I saw the night sky away from the city, I had no clue what it even looks like. It's just a spectacular feeling to experience. But this also has a, an effect on a lot of wildlife um, because there's a lot of birds that use you know, stars to navigate. So all of a sudden, when you've got city lights all around you, it's very disorient it's disorienting and it causes huge numbers. I mean, we're talking probably millions of deaths uh, every year from birds kind of getting lost in city cores and flying into windows. Um, and the solution to this, which is being implemented um, and to some success is kind of lights out initiatives where using the latest technology with radar, trying to predict migration and then issue kind of alerts to cities and letting them know, okay, the next couple nights, we're gonna to try to turn off as many lights as possible um, because there's gonna be lots of birds migrating over. Um, okay. So this, and obviously for wildlife living, um, it's difficult as well with, uh, with light pollution. But one of the things I like to do is try to showcase as much detail in the sky as possible despite light pollution. So here's an example of this. This is a photo I captured in Stanley Park. So in the middle of Vancouver and this is obviously not what it looks like to your eyes at all, but this is completely real in that it was taken from one place um, at one time. It's a, real comp it's a real composition of the sky and the boats, but this required several hours of exposure time. So I was out there for like four hours or so, and I was using special filters that, you know, block out light pollution and just allow, you know, light from space to pass through. And I'm using a special camera that can see these deep reds that are in the sky that a normal camera and our eyes can't see. And this wow. was the result. So even with light pollution, it's possible to do astrophotography, but it's a lot easier to do it from a dark place. So here's an example of uh, photographing in a dark place. These photos are from Joshua Tree National Park. Um, it is a lot easier to capture photos like this in, uh, in Joshua Tree National Park in California, where it's dark. Um, again, this, these are photos captured using, you know, long exposure times um, and a special camera that's modified to see these nebulas and a technique called stacking where we basically take lots of photos of the same thing and then combine them and take the average of all the photos which basically gets rid of all the noise and makes that detail much more visible and much more sharp um, mm -hmm. and that's the technique used to capture these pictures now the thing about astrophotography that applies to my skills as a wildlife photographer is the concept of planning your photo mm -hmm. so the amazing thing about astrophotography that differs from most genres of photography is that you can plan every aspect of your photo before you take it because you know what your foreground is going to look like for the most part. You know exactly what the sky is going to look like and you can know exactly where in the sky interesting things are going to be. Where's the Milky Way? Where's this constellation? Where's this nebula? You know everything. So you can envision a photo and know exactly what it's going to look like years before you actually take it. And this is that was the case for this photo here. I'd had this photo in mind for months, if not like years because I'd been, you know, playing around in my, um, you know, like a, a planetarium software I have called Stellarium. And I noticed this beautiful nebula, the North American nebula, which by the way, this is at like 150 millimeters or so. So it's a huge nebula, um, would be positioned directly over this pair of peaks north of my city called the Lions in the wintertime. Um, it was remarkable. I, I couldn't believe it. I like it was perfectly situated over the Lions at the, if you go at the right time and the right place in the winter. So I knew what this photo was going to look like. I just had, I just needed to wait a very, very long time for a clear night, basically, because it rains a lot here in the winter. And yeah. I went there and I managed to pull off this photo. 
Um, and again, this is like several hours of exposure time using a few different filters, but all captured from the same place at the same time. And it's a real sky with a real foreground. But I also like to use astrophotography to tell stories. Um, here in, in the southwestern part of British Columbia, there's a place called Vancouver Island. And yeah. Vancouver Island is home to some of the last old growth ancient trees in the province. Um, it's some of the highest density of these ancient trees, but it's a minuscule fraction that's remaining. It's like a fraction of a fraction that's remaining of these huge giant trees. So this here is a Douglas fir tree that's about a thousand years old. It's the wow. second largest Douglas fir tree in the country, and it's been nicknamed Big Lonely Doug. And Big Lonely Doug was uh, spared um, around 2011. All of the old growth forest around it was cut down, but they, the, the loggers spared Lonely Doug. But not so many, not all big trees have been fortunate. Um, the vast majority of the big trees have been cut down and a lot of it remains unprotected. This tree only was protected in 2019 and it was only just protected because it's huge. It wasn't, you know, you know, there was a lot of public pressure to protect it, but a lot of our old growth forests are made unprotected. These old growth forests provide irreplaceable habitat and diversity and carbon storage. Um, but I wanted to capture an impactful image of Lonely Doug, um, something that I hadn't seen before. And I thought, what better backdrop than the night sky? Because when we're looking in the night sky, we're looking back in time. The stars in this image are, you know, hundreds, some of them thousands of light years away. Wow. And that light basically means when we look at the sky, we're looking at what these stars looked like a hundred or a thousand or a few thousand or 10,000 years ago, because it takes that long for that light to reach our eyes here on earth. But the remarkable thing is Lonely Doug is a thousand years old. So Lonely Doug has been there since before the light from a lot of these stars even left to its, and made its journey towards earth. So I call this photo space and time, because I really mm -hmm. think, you know, when we're looking at a thousand year old tree in front of the night sky, we are looking across space and time. Absolutely. And here's one other photo. These two photos were captured very recently, just this month. Um, here's one other photo, another example of, you know, planning being really important. And one thing I've always wanted to combine is the night sky with some of our beautiful marine life here, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, and we have beautiful intertidal life here. So this is life that lives below the water at uh, high tide and sometimes gets above the water when the tide gets very low. Um, and some of these animals are anemones. So what you see at the bottom here are anemones. Um, so this species of anemone, the aggregating anemone clones itself. So these are all clones of one animal um, living in a colony in a tide pool. But to get this photo, I wanted to get the Milky Way core with these anemones. I needed a low tide that was happening at night. And there were something like four nights in the entire year where you could get the Milky Way core at night with a low tide. And another photo, you know, I've been envisioning for years, um, but I, I, there was a couple nights this month where it worked. I went to photograph it. The light you see on the horizon there is actually the moon setting. Um, and I took this photo with an underwater housing with the, with the port half above the water, half below the water. Now this is a, a focus stack and, ex, and exposure bracket. So it's, it's one scene, but I used separate settings for the sky and for the foreground in order to get that full dynamic range of the sky and the foreground. So this, the sky is a slightly longer exposure than the foreground. Um, and I deliberately actually left the stars a little bit out of focus because I liked how they kind of glowed uh, a little bit out of focus. I, I shot photos where the stars were sharp, but I found they just didn't stand out as much. And I also was planning on waiting for the moon to set, but I really liked how the moon looked on the horizon. Um, and this was the final result, uh, you know, and kind of the moral of the story is here, planning is so important. And I've started taking that planning that I've learned from astrophotography and brought it to my wildlife photography when it comes to trying to, you know, envision where animals might be and where I can get the best shots. So with those anemones, I wanted to transition to kind of the final big topic that I want to talk about, which is British Columbia coastal wildlife. Um, because I think one of the things that makes this part of the world so unique is our really diverse and abundant and rich marine ecosystems. We have, you know, incredible animals like the humpback whale pictured here. This whale put on, you know, this, it was absolutely incredible. This whale breached 15 times in a row. Wow. Um, and photographing whales breaching can be very difficult because sometimes it will just happen. And there's sometimes, pretty, when, when you just are looking in one direction, all of a sudden a whale just jumps out of the water in the other direction. There's like nothing you can really do about that. Um, you just have to enjoy the moment. But when it comes to photography, 
often when whales breach, they breach several times. I would say like half of the time I've seen whales breach, it's breached more than once. Um, mm -hmm. So this whale took the record though, 15 breaches in a row um, over, you know, like 15 to 30 minutes. So wow. <laughs> this was a very, very active whale. This whale is nicknamed Mathematician. Um, and every single whale that Ray is a regular in the waters around here in the Salish Sea has a nickname or a designation um, so, uh, so that they can kind of track their movements and, you know, where they are at different times of year. Um, and why whales breach, we don't actually really know. Um, in this particular case, uh, there had been some transient orcas about, you know, a kilometer or two away that we had just seen. And transient orcas hunt marine mammals, including baby whales. Um, so maybe this was kind of an alarm to, in response to that. A breach makes a huge amount of sound underwater. So it can be one of the theories is that it's a communication mechanism. But only the whale knows why they breach. We don't really know. <laughs> Do you have a mechanism to understand which one it is? Because you just mentioned the name. Is it just with the location or it's with the character? Yeah. So the way you identify humpback whales is when they dive, okay. they put their, their tail up above the water. We call it the fluke. Mm -hmm. And the underside of every whale's fluke is different. It's like a fingerprint. Oh, okay. So every single whale has a unique pattern of kind of scarring and coloration, a mix mm -hmm. of like different mixes of kind of white and black on their tail. And okay. using that, um, you can identify them to the individual. So you need a photo of basically the tail going yeah. down, which is actually the easiest photo to get because whenever they die, you see that, that tail going down. Um, mm -hmm. And for other whales like killer whales, they use their dorsal fin. Um, mm -hmm. Humpback whales don't really have a big dorsal fin, but other whales, which we'll look at in a moment, have a dorsal fin and then they can use those to uh, to basically match them. So they try to get a photo and then you could, they have catalogs and we look through the catalog and, and match up what we're seeing with what's in the catalog. And if it's not in the catalog, then it might be a whale that's not normally in the area or it might be a whale that you know hasn't been observed yet. So that's always exciting. Great. So we have uh, other marine mammals that are also charismatic. One of my favorites are the sea lions. These are stellar sea lions. They're actually a cousin of the grizzly bear. Um, you know, grizzly bears in evolution ended up on land and sea lions ended up in the water, but um, they are very similar uh, in structure and their, you know, their skulls are almost identical. Um, mm -hmm. But sea lions are really fun to watch. They have so much character. They're huge. Um, here's one of some of them. These are just young, young males, mostly uh, pictured here with a very large bird, a glaucous wing gull. They are very large animals. And while these animals, pinnipeds, so like seals and sea lions, seem quite clumsy above the water, they're very graceful under the water. Um, you know, they're, they're lots of fun to watch above water, but under the water is really where they're at home, um, beautifully moving around. They're really built for that underwater environment. And it's a good thing they are because there are predators that are waiting for them, including the orcas. Um, oh. I'm still waiting for the perfect orca breach. This is the best orca breach I've seen, but of course it was right in front of this dock. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was such a spectacular moment that I was just happy to, uh, to have captured it. Um, but this here is what we call a transient orca or a bigs orca. Mm -hmm. And this is a population of orcas that specializes in hunting seals and okay. sea lions and dolphins and porpoises and all these uh, marine mammals. So they are very active predators. Um, that's different from these orcas. So this here is what we call a resident orca. Wow. And our resident orcas um, specialize in eating almost exclusively one thing, which is salmon. This here is oh. a northern resident orca. There's a few different populations. At the southern end of Vancouver Island, there are southern resident orcas. Southern resident orcas are critically endangered with just about 75%, 75 individuals remaining or so. Mm -hmm. And they almost exclusively eat Chinook salmon. So they are very, very picky eaters, which, which um, you know, doesn't bode well when that's, a, 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 you know, people also like to eat Chinook salmon. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about salmon because salmon are such an important food source for so many animals. Um, yeah. Those seals, those sea lions eat salmon. The, or the, the resident orcas eat salmon. The transient orcas eat the seals, which eat the salmon. So, so many different animals in that marine environment eat salmon. And a few years ago, um, I finally, I, I wanted to photograph salmon underwater for so long and I'd done it with like a little underwater point and shoot, but uh, I finally uh, got on loan a, an Aquatech underwater housing for a few weeks to really mm -hmm. properly photograph the salmon underwater. And as you can see, they actually, you know, they move from the ocean, they come up the rivers to spawn. Um, and it's in that fresh water that you get these beautiful, big, 
congregations of them schooling in beautiful environments. And this is a photo that a friend of mine, Nick Thornton, captured of me um, swimming with these salmon in the canyon, just doing some free diving. So absolutely remarkable animals. And Great. salmon are a great example of how all these things are so connected. And we'll, we'll look at a few examples of this, but I want to talk to you about, in kind of talking about salmon, I want to talk to you about the sea otter. Um, sea otters are adorable. They're a member of the weasel family, some of the, the thickest fur in the world. Um, and they, we have them here on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the open ocean. So it's very hard to photograph when you're out there because you're bobbing up and down. Um, but, uh, you know, if you stay in the more calm waters, you can sometimes get really beautiful conditions for photographing them. And sea otters have a very interesting story. So sea otters eat sea urchins, um, among other things. But sea urchins are, they're one of the only animals that can like regularly consume lots and lots and lots of sea urchins. There's also some sea stars that do that. But, but sea otters eat a lot of sea urchins. Now, what happened was in the, in the 1920s or so, I believe 1929, sea otters became locally extinct. They became extirpated from the coast of Vancouver Island. Oh. Um, and that was because they were hunted for their fur, that thickest fur in the world, the den densest fur. Now this had consequences. So sea otters eat sea urchins. So now the sea urchins didn't have a predator, which means the sea urchins were able to multiply a lot. And sea urchins eat this plant here. They eat kelp. Well, it's, a, it's an algae, this kelp. Yep. And kelp, actually provides really important habitat for animals like salmon and other underwater life. So kelp is really important, especially for like young salmon looking for shelter when they come out of the rivers and into the ocean. So the disappearance of the sea otter led to an explosion of sea urchins, creating what we call urchin barrens, where it's just, just so many urchins and, and not much else, um, which impacted the kelp forests, which you know, reduces habitat for salmon, which thereby, you know, can affect all the other species that rely on salmon. So this is a classic example of what we call a trophic cascade. Yeah. And it really showcases how um, everything in these ecosystems here are, are very connected. And it's not just animals in the sea that are connected to salmon, it's also animals on land. And that's because animals like bears, for example, rely very heavily on salmon during the salmon run. So every year when the salmon head from the ocean, they head up river into the streams, they are hunting salmon. Um, and the bears have to have a lot of patience um, to catch salmon, which means the uh, photographer also has to have a lot of patience <laughs> to catch salmon, uh, to, catch, to catch them catching the salmon. Um, but my patience has been rewarded with a few, a few nice shots here. A black bear is catching a, a nice pink salmon. Um, and these bears have so much individual personality. Some of them are really good at hunting. Some of them are not. Some of them are super patient. Others are not. Um, this particular bear here was not patient and managed to capture a salmon very quickly before some other much more patient bears who have just been sitting and waiting, whereas this bear was just running around all over the place. And the other bears were not very happy about it. It's the first time I heard a bear, like, scream. They don't make <laughs> a lot of sound, but the bears were not happy when this bear caught the salmon. Um, and here's a photo just, I wanted to capture that patient. So this is a, just the, a bear's paws waiting by the stream for salmon to swim up. I used a long exposure. So maybe like a one second exposure on the tripod to capture that movement of the water. And animals are actually, you know, they don't sit still often, but when they do, they're a lot better at standing still than humans. So you can actually capture photos of wildlife with very long exposures. Um, and that's how I captured this photo here. Just of, I just, you know, zoomed in and cropped in on the paws of this bear with that, right. uh, with that stream. Great. But, but it's not just black bears. So these are black bears. Um, we mm -hmm. also have grizzly bears, which wow. forage on salmon. Um, grizzly bears are quite a bit larger. Um, they kind of have a different structure, a different shape. Um, and they rely even more on salmon than the black bears do in a lot of areas on the coast. So for this photo here, I had the option of just photographing this bear on the riverbank, but I purposely kind of you know, went behind these bushes and, you know, shot through the bush to get this kind of natural foreground. You know, when, when we're photographing, there's the, there's our subject, we've got the yeah. background behind the subject and we've got the foreground. Often myself and a lot of photographers, we kind of forget to put something to, to think about the foreground. Um, yeah. So in a case like this, I really love to, you know, put something in the foreground to kind of frame the scene and add a little bit more depth to it. Wonderful. 
And yeah, these, these grizzly bears are lots of fun to watch. Um, they are very at home in the water. You see them wading around in the pools quite a bit. Um, this particular shot was taken very in harsh lighting conditions, like midday. So I waited for the bear to kind of start stepping into the shade of the trees and exposed for those highlights and kind of got this nice kind of outline of the light hitting the bear's fur. Mm -hmm. And just like dogs, when bears get wet, they, they shake off that, uh, that water. Um, and it's a lot of fun to watch them just kind of totally shake off and, uh, and empty their fur of all the water. But bears are really connected to salmon. And so much so that in a year with very few salmon, um, they don't produce very many young. So these bears mate in the spring, but they have delayed um, implantation of the embryo. Um, so that means if they don't eat enough salmon, if they don't get enough nutrients, they will not be... The, the, the mothers are not going to be producing young the following year if they don't get enough salmon. So when you have really good salmon years, you'll see more cubs. And when you don't have a lot of salmon, they just are, in, they literally are incapable. Um, in some areas, if they don't get enough food, they will not produce cubs because they have delayed implantation. But one of the most adorable things I've seen <laughs> um, are grizzly bear cubs. Um, this was just a chance encounter in northwestern British Columbia, driving along and spotted a little brown blob on the side of the road. And then one head pokes out, then another head pokes out, and then two more. And it was a mother grizzly bear leading her three uh, very young cubs across the road. And, you know, different people have different opinions on whether animals, how emotional animals are. But I definitely think looking at this photo, you can really see um, some ex face expressions and emotion being expressed in these bears. Absolutely. Yeah. So one other animal that sometimes surprises people that they actually eat salmon are wolves. Um, wolves around here on the coast are a very unique kind of group of wolves, coastal wolves, um, which specialize on eating mostly seafood. So you, you see them for a lot of your kind of on the intertidal shoreline like this. You see them on the beaches um, looking for things that have washed up. Um, and uh, they are very elusive. They can be very hard to find. I've only seen a couple over the years. Um, and, you know, it's probably they've seen me more than I've seen them. So here's a photo I captured of one standing in a pile of debris along the shore, um, a pile of logs that have washed up. And I put this photo in black and white just to highlight the detail and the camouflage and those patterns. But if you look just kind of, if you go center just up to the left a tiny bit, you'll see the yep. wolf staring out from the debris there. Very, very well camouflaged. And while I haven't actually photographed it yet, wolves do eat salmon. Um, there's not a lot of people who have photographed it, but wolves mm -hmm. actually eat salmon. And it's something I would love to photograph um, in the years to come. I think that would be really, really cool. Amazing. But I needed to bring it back to birds because I love <laughs> birds. <laughs> um, and birds eat salmon too. So great blue herons eat loads and loads of juvenile salmon. Um, okay. They can't eat a big, an adult salmon, you know, they can be huge. They can be as yeah. big as people. But the, um, the baby salmon are very important food sources for the herons and the young of the heron. Mm -hmm. um, gulls eat a lot of salmon. Um, this here is one of my favorite lighting conditions when you've got kind of sunset or sunrise backlighting the feathers of a bird. It really makes them light up because those feathers are often quite uh, transparent. And you always yeah. see tons of gulls where you see salmon. Okay. And little birds too, like the American Dipper, also rely on salmon. So what this bird has in its beak here is a salmon egg. Um, oh, wow. and, yeah. And whenever I'm photographing a bird like this, I always, you know, it's nice to get a dipper on a rock, but if you can get just that little added extra element, it can really yeah. improve that shot. So here there's two added elements. One, I was using like a slower shutter speed to kind of capture some of that motion in the water. And two, yeah. that salmon egg in the beak, I think really kind of gives a speck of color for the eye to look at. Um, yeah. And this is one of my favorite birds, um, like in the world. It's one of my favorites. And a great story, too. Yeah. Yeah, they're very neat birds. But I think maybe kind of my favorite photography experience on the coast here is has been many occasions with bald eagles. Um, we have the we actually have the largest number of bald eagles, the largest bald eagle gatherings in the world happen here in British Columbia. Um, sorry to my American friends. I know you like to uh, <laughs> you know talk a lot about the bald eagles, but uh, we do get more <laughs> eagles here. Um, we get tens of thousands of them in the area, um, gathering to eat salmon and other food sources. And, you know, as majestic as these birds have a reputation to be, um, they do argue a lot. 
Um, they actually don't hunt all that much. They really prefer to scavenge. So whenever there's like a food source available, you just see tons of eagles bickering over it. Um, but I love photographing that bickering because it provides, you know, really great opportunities to get some more interesting action shots um, like you see here. Yep. You know, those, those eagle fights and stuff are, are a lot of fun to photograph. And eagles also play a very important role in the salmon. So eagles have these very sharp talons. Um, this is a picture I took of a very cooperative eagle um, that was just on a very rainy day perched next to the trail. And I just, I framed up on the talons because they were just mesmerizing. But eagles use those talons often to carry their food up into the trees, up into the forest to Oof. consume salmon. Um, so this here is an eagle eating a salmon in a tree. Now, they're not the only animals that are bringing salmon into the forest. Bears do it as well. So here's a bear yeah. carrying a very large salmon into the forest. And the reason they like to eat it in the forest is because it's a much more secure place where their you know, competitors are less likely to steal their food from them. But they're actually playing a really important role in this ecosystem because by bringing the salmon into the forest, they don't eat all of the salmon, especially later in the season when they're more full, if there's been a lot of salmon, they will leave parts of the salmon behind. And that like bears, for example, often at the very end of the season, if they're absolutely stuffed, um, they will just be eating the eggs, the, the yeah. row of the salmon. So they often leave salmon behind. So it's not uncommon to walk through the forest very far away from the streams and find eyes staring at you through the leaves. <laughs> and these are the remains of salmon that have been left on the forest floor. But these salmon actually have a role even in the forest, even after death, when they're left behind, because there are very special nutrients that are found in salmon that come from the ocean that aren't found in land. But when the salmon swim up the rivers to spawn, they're bringing these nutrients from the ocean. And then when the bears and eagles bring those salmon into the forest, they are bringing those nutrients right to the forest floor and those salmon decompose. And in decomposing, they're fueling the growth of the forest. So wow. there's been a lot of research done that shows where there are salmon, the trees grow more. Um, they That's grow bigger. Great. Um, if you look at the rings of trees, there's places in the world where they can see in the rings of trees, they can see thicker rings in years correlated with years where there's more salmon. And there's places where, you know, there'll be like a waterfall where there's salmon below the waterfall and no salmon above the waterfall. And the, the, the trees, the, the, there's higher production, the tree below the waterfall where the salmon are than above the waterfall where there's no salmon. And this has impl imp implications for climate change because trees are sequestering carbon and turning it from the atmosphere into a solid form. Um, so salmon play a more important role than we could possibly know and possibly ever imagine um, in this ecosystem. They really bind everything together. And I wanted to capture a photo showcasing the salmon below the water and that terrestrial ecosystem above the water. So this was a couple years ago when I had that underwater housing um, and this is the photo I got of some pink salmon in the river uh, with that forest behind them, which, uh, you know, despite being completely different, a tree and a fish, they are so intricately connected to one another. Beautiful. Now, I wanted to end with just a series of photos that I just took recently, again, like just this summer. Um, and because, you know, all, although the salmon aren't here all year round, so all these animals that are here to eat the salmon have to eat other things at other times of year. And that includes bald eagles. Okay. So there's a very special um, thing that happens every year uh, near Vancouver Island um, where there's some very narrow um, channels where current passes through really, really quickly when you've got like big tide changes. And when the current is passing through these channels quickly, it creates, there's like rocks underwater that creates upwelling and that shoots fish called hake, which is a, a, like a, a type of cod up to the surface. And those hake actually get uh, temporarily or permanently like damaged. Their air bladders kind of expand and it kind of stuns them on the surface. And you can imagine what that means for a bald eagle. So this creates a gathering of hundreds of bald eagles fishing for hake. And there are so many eagles and so many hake that you will get within kind of like meters of your boat every minute, you can get like a dozen eagles like a dozen strikes of the water where an eagle comes down and grabs fish right next to you, like every single minute. And this lasts for like a couple hours. Wow. So it is the most insane photography opportunity I've ever experienced with bald eagles, just because of how reliable it is. Um, because, and you get, you know, if you miss one shot, 
well, you're going to get another 100 opportunities, so don't worry about it. Um, it's just like a super reliable opportunity to, to photograph eagles. And I was so excited to spend some time with them this year and capture some of these photos. And remember, this is such a rich ecosystem. There's also dolphins around. Um, you know, we see this spring, we saw dolphins four days in a row, <laughs> um, which, wow. you know, doesn't always happen. But this spring that happened, we saw dolphins four days in a row. I saw orcas three days in a row. Again, that doesn't always happen, um, but there's a lot of orcas around. And of course, there's dozens and dozens of humpback whales in the area as well. Wow. So such a rich ecosystem. Bears too. Um, when the tide goes down, you, you see bears almost every day. Um, if you're looking for them on the beaches, foraging for, for food in the intertidal zone. But my personal favorite of all these photography opportunities are the bald eagles, because I truly believe like this is one of the best bald eagle photography opportunities in the world. Um, so I did want to mention before I conclude that if you want to join me next year <laughs> to photograph these bald eagles, um, I am putting together an itinerary. You can go to lerongertzmantours.com slash eagles um, and see some of those details and sign up for the wish list. And if you sign up with your email, I will notify you um, as soon as the bookings open, which will probably be uh, at the end of this summer. Um, so, and so I'm very, very, very excited for that. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank <laughs> you so much, everyone, for, for watching. Thank you so much uh, for having me present, too. I, uh, I really love doing this. I'm very passionate about, as you can probably tell, I'm very passionate about sharing stories and sharing photos. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In fact, the first question uh, someone is asking over here, uh, when is the season for if somebody want to join you? Yeah. So this, this tour that I'm going to be doing with the Eagles um, mm -hmm. is going to be in June or July. Um, so June or July. yeah, June, July is the time of year. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, probably like haven't selected the exact date yet, but it'll probably be kind of late June or July um, when, okay. we, when we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any suggestion on equipment for uh, this kind of workshop? Yeah, so the great thing about um, these eagles is that, I mean, they don't have fear of people really. So mm -hmm. they're just focused on the fish. So mm -hmm. my I'm using on a 100 to 400 millimeter lens um, because okay. they can be like, they can be right next to you, um, but mm -hmm. they're all around you. So there'll be ones that are like hundreds of meters away and then there'll be ones that are just meters away. So any lens is really good. I would say even a 70 to 200 could be could wow. work quite well for this. Um, mm -hmm. I even want to try getting some shots that show the environment more with like a wide angle lens because, you know, you can actually get them that close. But the thing with these eagles is we're photographing them from boats. So it's yeah. really nice to actually have like a, a, a lens that you're comfortable hand holding, like a 100 to 400 or a 200 to 600. Um, for the whales, it's sometimes having a longer like 500, 600 millimeter range is good. But I'm mm -hmm. all the photos you saw in the presentation today were taken pretty much exclusively with my 100 to 400 millimeter lens. That's great. Yeah. So most of the pictures which you have shown over here is from the boat or from the land too? Um, for these eagles fishing, it's from from the boat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a it's where the eagles are doing this. There's no roads. So there's no way to see it without a boat or like a float plane. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And how much uh, trucking is involved when it comes to bears? Yeah. So to be honest, I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bears in my life. And the vast majority of them have been crossing roads or on the side of the road. So a lot of the time, um, the most, most of the bears that I see are just on the side of the road. However, oh, okay. most of the bears that I photograph aren't on the side of the road. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, it's just not that great of a photo, <laughs> you know, a bear just on the side of the road with some yeah. exceptions like that grizzly bear mother crossing the road. But yeah. two, um, I, I want to, I always like to be a little bit careful around like um, getting the, I don't want to get the bears too comfortable with having people watching them next to the road because it is a little bit of a dangerous place for them with all the yeah. cars going by. Um, so I, most of the bear photographs that I take are on foot, um, but it's really more, what's more important is um, kind of finding a good food source. So the beach is at low tide, there's going to be bears, salmon, there's going to be bears. So finding that food source is how you find the bears. And then it's really important as well to, of course, photographing bears, be very respectful. Um, it's not in their nature to be dangerous animals, uh, not at all, but they're certainly powerful animals and they're capable of things. Um, so it's really important to, uh, you know, keep, keep the appropriate distance and use a telephoto lens 
and uh, monitor their behavior and kind of do some research into how bears act when they're nervous or how they act when they're agitated versus kind of how they're acting naturally. Okay. So when you talk about workshop, it's, is it only for um, uh, eagles or is there anything for the northern lights and bears and uh, hummingbirds? Because all these things you can spot all over Canada. Yes. So, so right now, um, the, the main workshop I am launching and working on right now is the eagle one. But the mm -hmm. eagle one will also include black bears and um, and whales and that sort of thing. Um, the okay. eagle, the, the main eagle photo opportunities last about two, two and a half hours each day. So that leaves okay. a lot of time to look for other things. But I am mm -hmm. developing all sorts of cool opportunities in the future with like hummingbirds and all sorts of other things. Um, so if you are interested in those, I would definitely follow my social media because I'll always be sharing those announcements on there. <laughs> Thank you. I think, yeah, that's pretty much what we have. We, we, questions have, we have more questions in our group oh, okay. also. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so can you explain? We can't see about, you, Hermi. Yeah. Can you explain about how you did your photos? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm using all sorts of techniques. So my camera, uh, so the camera I'm using right now is a Canon R5. Um, and I, but most, a lot of the, that I've only had the camera, you know, in the last, you know, year and a half or so. So a lot of the photos you saw in this presentation were also taken with a 5D Mark IV, 7D Mark II. Um, and I pretty much in first years now have been photographing with the Canon 100, 400 millimeter lens. I like to shoot action a lot. So I really like to use that setup handheld. Um, and what I really love to do, my approach to photography is often just to immerse myself in the world of the animals that I'm photographing. So I, I like to spend time doing things. So I'm gonna photograph eagles. I like to be there for a few days. Um, because those fleeting moments, um, that's what they are. They're fleeting moments and they're over very quickly, but nature is repetitive. So they often happen many times. So it's really useful to kind of really get to know the, what you're photographing and spend a lot of time with them in order to, uh, to get the best photos possible. Great. And what uh, post-processing tools you use? Yeah. So I process my photos in Lightroom and Photoshop, um, mm -hmm. for my, um, wildlife photography, I, I do tend to keep things very like photojournalistic. So I'm, I'm, you know, correcting exposure, yeah. correcting color balance, um, correcting contrast, and sometimes doing a little bit of dodging and burning. Um, but I very much am just trying to restore from the raw file, um, those, that vividness that you experience with your eyes. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with like removing things from a photo. Um, you know, photography is art after all. Um, yeah. If it's going to be used in the context of photojournalism, it's important that there's disclosure about what was altered in the photo. But yeah. um, I, for astrophotography, though, it's a completely different story because astrophotography, my original photos look very little like the final result, not because I'm adding things to them, but just because I'm doing so much processing to pull out as much data as possible. It's the same techniques that are used for pretty much every photo you've ever seen from like the Hubble Space Telescope or the new James Webb Telescope, like just pulling out as much data as possible in a scientifically accurate way. Great. Yeah, that's another question we had. Uh, you mentioned in between about a particular type of camera which you use to extract the light. Uh, would you like to say something about it? Yeah, so what that is, so normal cameras, like any DSLR and mirrorless camera that you buy, um, have basically a piece of glass in front of the sensor that mm -hmm. is designed to block out everything but basically what our eyes can see. And that's because the, the photos are supposed to look like what you see with your eyes. Like that's the point yeah. of a camera. So that, so it, so it can't see, you know, our eyes actually don't see red very well compared to like how much light red, how vivid red is. Um, and our eyes certainly can't see like infrared or anything like that. So what I've done to, I have a Canon 6D, like just an older DSLR, which is what was used to take almost all of the photos you saw of the night sky. Um, mm -hmm. is uh, there's companies that will, you can send your camera to, and what they will do is they will take that piece of glass away and replace it with a piece of glass that allows more wavelengths of light to come into the camera sensor. And mm -hmm. that's what we call an astro modified camera. So basically, okay. usually an astro modified camera just can see deeper into the reds than a normal camera, which lets okay. you photograph nebulas all of a sudden your, your photos will have more pinks and reds in them because now you can see these nebulas in the night sky when you take your photos. Um, yeah. however, now your photos taken in the daytime are going to look a little reddish as well. So it does, you can use filters to kind of like revert your camera back to looking like a normal camera, 
but uh -huh. you know it, it's a little cumbersome if you're like a full-time wildlife photographer to have your main camera be astro modified so for that reason i use a a separate camera for astronomy which is my which is a canon 60 which i just bought used and you know relatively affordable yeah. compared to a lot of the gear people are using <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it makes and, sense and we have another question what do you believe that makes your image successful Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think in general, like when I look at wildlife photography, I don't know about my images necessarily, but like, I'm always looking when I look at wildlife photography for to feel something. Like when I look at an image, I want to feel emotion, I want to feel some kind of impact. And it's actually, to be honest, a pretty hard thing to do. Like you can have a beautiful photo, like, like most of the photos I've shared today, like are photos I'm happy with, but I wouldn't say there's like an emotional impact in, in most of them. It's very hard to get like an emotional impact. But for me, um, when you look at a photo and feel that emotional impact, that's when it's a really successful photo. And I don't know what it is. I think it can be all sorts of things that kind of create that emotional impact. But certainly, I think capturing fleeting moments and unique behaviors and uh, expressions in wildlife is a really good way to, uh, to kind of get that impact in your photos. Great. Great. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, thank you uh, so much. <laughs> thank and you for having there, me. <laughs> is there any specific destination in Canada that you recommend for wildlife photography? Um, there are so many places. So, I mean, the coast of BC here, like where, I, where I'm running this eagle tour, is remarkable. Um, there is, you know, bears, whales, eagles, all that stuff. Um, I love northern British Columbia as well as, as a bird person. Um, there is amazing bird photography opportunities and just birds in general in Northern British Columbia. And it's a really unique uh, unique place. Like the science, the scientist side of me really kind of nerds out about that area because um, I geek out <laughs> because um, it's really cool from like a genetics and evolution perspective because you've got like Eastern birds meeting Western birds in the North of British Columbia. So if you like birds, that's a cool place. But if I could go anywhere in Canada right now that I haven't been, I would say probably the Arctic. I've never been to the Arctic. So I'd love to get up to like Nunavut or the North, like the Arctic Ocean and, and see polar bears and, and other animals up in the, uh, in the Canadian Arctic. Great. Great. And one, one last question. In addition to uh, lots of practice and patience, what is your best tip for a budding wildlife photographer? Well, my tip would be practice and patience. <laughs> um, but I would say other, other than that, um, I would say for a, a wildlife photographer, um, getting to lear learning as much po as possible about what you're photographing is really important um, yeah. because you need, I mean, it goes without saying that you need to be patient and you need to practice. You need to spend a lot of time in the field to get the best photos. But the thing that kind of will give you a much better chance at getting those photos is really knowing about what it is you're photographing so that you understand their behavior, you understand where to find them. And in regards to the behavior, you understand when those unique and interesting behaviors that you want to photograph are most likely to happen. And if there's any indication that it's about to happen, for example, like when a bird is um, bathing, when a bird finishes splashing around in the water, it'll always flap its wings. So little things like that, um, and just that understanding and knowledge of the, the subject, the animal that you're photographing, I think are, is really useful for trying to get the best photos possible. Great. <laughs> Great, yeah, very valuable tips. <laughs> Yep. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we'll we'll uh, come back with some other sessions soon. Yeah, yeah, and I'll definitely going to join you for the next workshop as well as <laughs> we we will definitely get in touch with you for an article for our magazine. We have an online magazine, uh, so we would definitely love to get a combination. You know, it, it's yeah. not that. Uh, easy to find someone with a science background as well as <laughs> uh, artistic background. So uh, any input from you will more add value. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, Thank I'd love you. to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was an amazing experience. Um, you know, yes. like Peter, the combination of science and uh, photography is always so amazing. The, yeah. And the best part was his passion was so visible from the uh, beginning till the end. That spirit was always there. So it's yes, so one hour with see. so much of energy. He <laughs> energy. Uh, uh, I don't know, Hermi, your video is off. Is I'm, it purposely? I have, no, I, I have purposely made it off because I'm <laughs> coughing too much in between.
<laughs> oh. so I don't want. <laughs> All yeah. right. Okay. I have a very really bad cough. Sorry. Yeah, you take care, please. Yes. Uh, so, a nice uh, session ended beautifully. A lot yeah. of learning. Yeah. And I hope all our uh, audience have uh, happy as well. Benefited. I learned as well. Yes. Learned. Yes. Yeah. So, and tomorrow we have another session. That's also going to be an amazing session. I'm sure. <laughs> Waiting for that. So that's all for today. Yeah. Uh, yes. So bye for now. See you tomorrow. Take See care, you tomorrow. everyone.